All right, so before we take a look specifically at page 675, number 59, just a word on these projectile motion parametric equations. Do we understand that these are giving the horizontal and vertical components based on time? You see, if an object is projected, it's always going to follow the same type of path. That's something you can study a bit in physics. But essentially, it's always going to be quadratic. It's going to be parabolic. But the cool thing about these two parametric equations is that they give you the breakdown. You know, like if an object, after so much time, is in this location, we're able to see separately what the x component would be. Of course, the x component is like the horizontal distance compared with the y component, which of course is the vertical distance. And what you want to understand is that those are going to be all based on the same time, whatever that time might be. Of course, we could plug that into both these equations and once again, get the x and the y components. Now, sometimes students get all hung up because there's so many variables, but do we understand that the t is really the third variable. Of course, we call that the parameter. The other variables, theta, well, that's just gonna be the initial angle. And V naught, well, that's just the initial velocity. And then, of course, we have H, at least for the one component, that's the initial height. All right, pretty cool equations. They give you X and Y based on T. Of course, they give them separately. So now let's use these equations, let's actually answer a problem. By the way, you guys are going to do a problem similar to this in the exit as the exit question. So in order to write the parametric equations for this baseball, uh, we're going to need some initial values. We're going to need the initial velocity. Now, the initial velocity is 100 miles an hour, but it needs to be converted, as it says up in the uh, description, uh, it needs to be in feet per second. So basically, we got to take 100 miles an hour and we have to convert that. And an easy way to convert 100 miles an hour into feet per second is with a little factor label method. If you've not studied this in chemistry, basically, we just need to cancel the labels. The labels are miles and hours. Let's start by canceling the hours. So one hour cancels, or excuse me, one hour goes with 60 minutes, but that's of course gonna cancel the hours. And then um, one minute will cancel the minutes, goes with uh, 60 seconds. So now we have it in miles per second, but we want it to be in feet per second. So we need to cancel the miles. So one mile, remember that magic number, 5,280 feet in a mile, but that cancels the mile label. And if you multiply all this out, you're gonna end up with approximately 146. Let's just go to six, seven feet per second. Well, that's gonna be your initial velocity. So of course that's going to fill in very nicely uh, into uh, both the X and the Y uh, parametric equations for V naught. Now, we actually don't have an angle. That's because as you go down through the rest of the questions, it's going to be asking you to think about some different angles. So in other words, I don't have something to fill in right at this very moment for theta, but I am ready to finish my Y component, which needs the initial height. That's three. The baseball is batted at a height of three. And then, uh, well, I got my initial velocity this time with the sine of theta times t. Okay, just kind of a little, by the way, you don't need these parentheses, uh, but sometimes it's just kind of helpful uh, because it kind of lets t feel a little bit more like a variable that's on the outside. But um, parentheses or no parentheses, I still need to finish the rest of the y parametric equation minus 16t squared. Where did that come from? 
Um, well, basically negative 16 is the uh, factor of acceleration due to gravity. Again, something that you can study a little bit more in your physics class, but um, there's your two parametric equations. In order to use our graphing calculator to analyze the path of the ball for question B, we're going to need to first make sure that the calculator is in the right mode. So just in case you were using calculator for something else, you want to make sure that you're in degree mode, okay? because those projectile motion formulas, the theta is in degrees. You also want to make sure you're in parametric mode, so of course we get that third variable called the parameter. So when you go to the y equals screen, you definitely get your x and y equal components. You can see that I went ahead and inserted 15 degrees in for theta. I did that in my uh, for the cosine of 15 degrees for the x equals equation, and then also for the sine of 15 degrees down here in the sine in the y equals equation. So I got my two equations set up. Of course, the parameter is part of both equations. That's what's going to ultimately get a graph. Are we ready for the graph? Are we ready? Are we ready? Because here comes strike one. That's right. We forgot about the window. You see, most of the time, the reason that you're not getting a graph is because something's wrong with your window. If you've not messed around with the window yet, let's take a closer look here. We've got the T min and max. Now, students, that would be like the times that I want to investigate. How did I know to go to seven seconds? Well, it's just kind of a guess. I don't think the ball's going to be in the air more than seven seconds. But that's what those values represent. Again, it's like the time. Next, we get the T-step. What the heck is the T-step? Is that the new dance that they're teaching you in uh, gym class? I mean, you put your left foot in, you turn around uh, two pi, and everybody... Uh, try to uh, pass through the asymptote or something. No, seriously, the T-step. Imagine you're doing this problem by hand and you were making a table of values. This would be like the increment for your T-values. So what's happening here is the calculator is going to produce a, a, a point. In other words, it's going to connect the dots every every tenth of a second. Well, that's not bad. I mean, that'll be fine. Um, I'll, I'll share with you, you, you don't want your T-step to be too big because you don't want to get a graph where you only see like every two seconds or every five seconds. You want, why don't we see every tenth of a second? It'll give us a more precise graph. The X, min and max. Okay, I think that the home run fence is 400 feet out there. So why don't we make the horizontal distance at least get to 400? Why did I start at negative 10? I just wanted to, to kind of see a little bit more of the back side of the graph. And why did I go to 420? Because maybe the home run will go into the stand so I can catch it. So I just kind of went a little further. Now the Y min and max, to be honest, I don't really know much about that, uh, but it does represent the height of the ball. Again, I don't really know what the height of the ball is, but I'm kind of just guessing that it's probably not going to go much higher than 50 feet. Uh, if it does, I can go back and change it. And if there's too much space, I can... Again, go back and change it. All right, ready to graph it? This is going to be the flight of the baseball. There it goes, and there it is. Okay, now that graph actually, again, is the path of the baseball. But the cool thing is when you trace it, you can also see the time that matches with each X and Y value. So at zero seconds, it starts at a height of three. Well, we kind of know that. How about at one second? Looks like it's uh, it's uh, 141 feet out and it's at a height of almost 25. Okay, but of course what I'm curious about is what's going on out here at the home run fence. Now, when I get close to the home run fence, um, that is when I get to the height of the home run fence, okay, I'm kind of close. I'm at like a height of nine or maybe I'm at a height of 12, but look at the X component. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's 90 feet short, okay? That, that's a fly ball that's going to get caught. So by this uh, ordered pair, when T equals 2.2 seconds, I can see that the ball's already 
past 10 feet. In other words, it's lower than 10 feet, but it certainly hasn't traveled far enough horizontally. So that'd be one reason that I could say no. Again, it, it's not far enough. Or I could see what happens when the ball gets to the ground, where uh, literally if the ball hits the ground, it's going to be apparently really close to about 340 feet. It's not exact, but again, that is short of the home run fence, which would have to be out at 400 feet. So I think we have a pretty good uh, sort of proof here by either of these ordered pairs that this is not a home run.